can I, everyone hear us great good afternoon i hope all of you enjoyed your lunch and i hope all of you don't sleep through this session anyway um so uh, my name is vinod um, i work with thoughtworks um, um, as a project manager and uh, this is uh, praveen praveen do you want to hi i'm yourself? praveen i work with a company called trainline.com uh, which is primarily a UK based company and we work with Thoughtworks to develop our product. I am offshore head of uh, development. Yeah. Um, so before we start, um, just wanted to raise of hands, how many of you have been part of knowledge transfers? Great, excellent. So ho hopefully we have a good set of folks who will understand the context of what we are talking about. And um, this is probably quite novel that we have the customer and the vendor here making this presentation together because we have actually undertaken this journey together. And knowledge transfer is typically an exercise which has a lot of undercurrents typically. There are many shades of undercurrent. People, you know, some folks may feel insecure, some folks would know that it is probably loss of business, loss of jobs, loss of, you know, many other things. Um, so it is it's not necessarily an easy exercise. Uh, just a quick refresh on the uh, agenda. Uh, brief on the CTP. CTP is the exercise uh, that we did uh, between ThoughtWorks and Trainline. Um, it's a short form for capacity transformation program. Just specific to what, uh, in this context, it is. You don't need to understand what those details are. It's a specific to this program. The learnings uh, that uh, we, um, you know, took from the program. Uh, something on the methodology itself. Um, uh, so before we start uh, about this, I would like to uh, tell a bit more about the trainline.com. We are essentially an online train retailing uh, website. We are the largest train ticket seller in the UK uh, in, in online presence. Probably 80% of the online tickets is provided for majority of their websites are trendline.com white level websites. So we pretty much capture uh, the UK, the real industry in terms of online presence. We also uh, have various other types of uh, customers, like for example tra travel management companies, big corporates, and, and hence we provide uh, web service gateways as well, through which you can go ahead and book uh, the train ticket. So uh, just, just one more point, uh, just in terms of the size and scale, um, the trainline.com probably does more than um, 3 billion euros worth of business on their website. And that really is the soul and substance of the company. Uh, the company's engine is the trainline.com website itself. So what we had created and what we had been maintaining, uh, what the company is all about. Yep. So, so what happened uh, during during last many years, approximately seven to eight years, since Trainline is working with ThoughtWorks is, we have together developed a big platform, a pretty complex platform, because a rail industry in UK is pretty complex, and hence the software that we create is pretty complex. Primarily, the software was developed uh, by ThoughtWorks uh, in, in India. In last year, uh, and, and during this period, of course, in, in UK, which is primarily London, uh, we have grown up our development team as well, uh, from tiny to significant size. Last year, there was a business drive to, tra to transfer the ownership of the software which is being developed in India, primarily to the UK, to, our, to, to do in, in, in housing, essentially. The reason was pretty simple. One was decreased capital expenditure, uh, because the challenge was that a big team, uh, which is uh, here in India, has to reduce to a significantly smaller team in, in, in the UK. 
Another one was insourcing and uh, the development team uh, sit together. How, how we needed to do it? It was not just transferring the software from one location to another or, or transfer few resources from here to there. It was, as I said, seven year old program running in Bangalore. Lots of infrastructure developed during that time frame. Lots of complex software developed during that uh, time frame. And, and, and many more. Yeah, so, so when he had told that we have, we have to do this exercise, we don't know where to start. Um, as Praveen was saying, this is like something that we had built over seven years. And what you build over seven years is not just a pieces of functionality. Uh, what you built over uh, this period could also be some of the processes involved, you created roles, you created an entire structure, infrastructure around it, multiple things by then. And we didn't know where to start. Uh, this is not like a normal project. Because there's a normal project, there's a functionality, you start talking about requirements, um, and, and, then, and then you can start writing stuff. But what do you do here? Uh, so we had a meeting. Uh, and when you start off, typically, you know, all the leaders and the managers started talking. Um, and everybody had their points of view. The release manager brought in things about processes. The lead BA talked about uh, you know, features, channels, and things like that. The architect spoke about uh, you know code base. Several folks spoke, spoke about many things. Um, we had to brainstorm a lot, and then when you know word started started going out, the developers came and said, "Hey, I mean, don't we talk about working code? Shouldn't that be the essence of what we are trying to transfer?" And we thought, "Yeah, that that, that makes sense." Um, so we said, um, "You know, there is all this complexity." But what has to be the primary element around which everything else revolves should be working code. So we made sure that the, uh, the, the uh, stem cell, if you can call it that, of this program would be working code. Everything else would be ancillaries that would revolve around it. Be it process, be it structure, be it infrastructure, be it anything else, <coughs> would revolve around making sure that this working code gets transferred uh, appropriately, securely, and in a working uh, then the next one was, uh, how do you actually transfer? Uh, I'm sure uh, those of you who have been part of knowledge transfer exercises would uh, would know. The first thing you would do is get some documentation, uh, sit through sessions, try and understand what the application is doing and all of that. Uh, ThoughtWorks and Trainline have been working together for a long time. So we were extremely, extremely uh, settled on working using agile patterns. And we were pretty loath about documentation or, or even workshops. We've been using uh, pair program, program for a long while. So we, we for, for us, this was the least effective classroom. For us, the most effective is if someone went to pair with us and actually deliver functional code. Um, and that's that's where you build context. That's where uh, you know you you get a sense of confidence that you can actually take this forward. Any other kind of learning is just going to be passive learning. Uh, you may have learnt it, you may be able to write an exam, but if somebody were to ask you to build something with what you have just listened in a classroom, the confidence would not be there. Uh, so uh, we were all very clear that the most effective is that we will pair when we are executing projects and that's how we are going to transfer this. Um, and if there were no project that may actually fit into that module or that component that we wanted to, then the next best thing would be we will pair when you know working on let's say there are some regression defects or any small items that may come up and all that. So we will we may have to in some cases force fit those if those kinds of projects did not come our way. So we were very clear that um, this is knowledge transfer. It's it's actually more than that. It's ownership transfer, and the way we are going to transfer is by pairing and actually working on functionally relevant projects. So. Uh once again, as I said, rail industry in UK is very, very complex. So is our software. We literally looked into our. Uh, uh, by the way, this this does has just a replica of it, uh, for for all the sensitivity purposes. We have just named our services as one, two, three, but there is very in depth behind it. So what essentially we did is we sat down with our architects and we tried to find out what is the core of our system, what really we need to transfer, and how do we need to transfer which, how the team compositions is going to look like. It is not that we are going to send 20 people from here and sitting over there with the guys over there. So, and, and in addition to that, 
what all projects are running while we are doing this knowledge transfer and which projects are the candidate for the knowledge transfer and which project is not the candidate for the knowledge transfer, things like that. Plus, there, were, there will be lots of things which is not technical, like process. So how would we go through each one of them and how would we uh, put uh, work around so that once the ThoughtWorks team is not there or once the ThoughtWorks team is with a minimum size, our production system doesn't uh, fall apart because that's most important to us. We don't want to lose uh, production systems. And just to put a bit more on it, for the last two years, we rarely had any priority one issues uh, in, in our system. So we did not really want it to be in a state where in, as soon as the knowledge transfer finishes, there are thousands of P1s coming up. So, so that was a big challenge. So what we did is we sat down together, we looked into each of the pieces that we have, and we started putting them one at a time on the timelines. Uh, by the way, we were given uh, a little bit of money compared to how much we have built in last many years and 10 months time that during next 10 to 11 months, you'll have to transfer everything. And while you are transferring everything, you are ramping down in India. Uh, so what we essentially did is we went through each of these items and put them on the timeline. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so there was, a plan, there was a plan put in place and that's obviously important. What happened to the plan is a different matter. We'll talk about it. Uh, but yeah, there was a plan. It has to be there. At least we knew that there were about 17 units that needed to get transferred. And what you saw in the previous picture was sort of a, a, a visual depiction of how, you know, how they all interact and what they mean and all of that. Um, and then we actually got into the execution. And that's where we started using a lot of Agile methodologies. We never called it, let's use Agile, because we were always Agile, so for us, it was second nature. Only when we stepped back and looked at it, we realized there are so many elements of uh, Agile that we've actually utilized in this whole process. Uh, so obviously, it's distributed Agile teams. Did you Yeah, so I'll come to that. So that's going to be part of how uh, we actually understand. <coughs> Distributed Agile teams, it would have been great if all the 40 or 50 members from London had come over to Bangalore, or it would have been great if all the 100 people from Bangalore had gone over to London. We didn't get that kind of budget, um, so we couldn't do that. So we had to pretty much work uh, in a distributed ma fashion, and we will get into depths on what that meant, how we did that. Um, continuous delivery, um, we, are, uh, we are using that in a slightly different context from what Jess was mentioning. Um, there were critical projects, functional projects had to keep going. While we were doing this program, you could not stop what the business required. Um, so, you know, we had releases that were going out every five weeks, complete platform releases that were going every five weeks. So that needed to keep going while we were delivering this as well. Um, and then, of course, uh, ownership transfer. Um, as I had mentioned, knowing is not enough. Owning is far more than that. Uh, and so we really had to define what that ownership means. It could mean change to processes. It could mean there were different teams. I say, as I said, there were 100 members here. There were 100 members in London. Uh, so we were not all one team. We had you know, specific teams who were doing specific things, th uh, you know, themes. So who owns what? How does that work? Where does the infrastructure go? Uh, we had about 650 virtual machines in Bangalore. What happens to all that? Is London going to recreate all of it? So multiple things, all of that conjoins to you know what we are talking about in terms of ownership and of course metrics I mean what does good look like I mean how do you even measure uh, something like this you know you can't some nobody can come and tick and say yeah we are done um, and then and then if production breaks tomorrow then you would realize that you are not done so uh, how do you actually measure and figure out if you're going in the right direction if you're going in the right phase uh, things of that nature so these are all the different elements that we try to address while we are going through this uh, exercise uh, so from a distributed team perspective, the first thing uh, that we did was uh, we decided if you are picking a certain functional component, we had mapped it to a project that was running at that point in time. And we knew that this project uh, required a lot of changes to happen in that component. So we, we created a team which was a mix of Bangalore and London members. What did that mean? We had two members from London who were pairing with the Bangalore folks. Uh, we made sure that there was one dev manager. So we used to call that as a dev manager, scrum master either way. We had one dev manager and one uh, business analyst who was giving requirements. So both folks on either side got the same set of requirements, were following the same process, were part of the same stand-ups, were part of the same uh, retros and things of that nature. Um, and all have one goal of delivering the project. 
the knowledge transfer was sort of, uh, you know, it, it was there, but they were all, the, the team was focused on delivering that functionality. The fact that they were gaining knowledge was slightly secondary. Um, so, so we sort of took that whole focus from, you know, having to think of knowledge transfer to actually delivering this. But what we did was, in each of those, uh, uh, we will come to that in the metrics case. Uh, in each of those iterations that we had, we had one story around knowledge transfer, where at the end of the iteration, we'll check with the team members on, you know, what have they learned, what is their level of confidence and things like that. So there was something that was happening on a iteration basis in terms of how much we are making progress. With them. Uh, one more thing I would like to add here is, uh, London made a pretty, uh, good effort in that, London developers particularly. Given the five and a half hours time lag, uh, it would have been pretty difficult had they been stubborn. I'll come to office only at nine. So what they did is they started waking up early. Since they started waking up early, sometimes five o'clock in the morning and started pairing with us. What happened essentially is our velocity increased because the guys sitting in Bangalore were causes of this fact that the guys in London are waking up early from five and the surrounding team members were very cautious that not to disturb them because they were with the headphones. So essentially what happened, they were getting six to seven hours of uninterrupted time where they worked literally together and that literally increased our velocity quite a lot. Yeah, I think that's, oh. that's what we had spoken about here. We can probably move on. I was also told that we have got another five minutes to go, so we probably need to rush. Okay, uh, I'll rush uh, then. So metrics, as we know, already mentioned, it is not uh, pure science. Go and tick these boxes and you are done. Uh, what we knew is we have limited budget, limited timeline, and there should not be any P1. So essentially what we started looking into is what the regression issues were looking earlier uh, before we go to production and how the regression issues are looking after. And, and that's the only thing that we literally tracked during yeah. this period. Yeah, so regression. Obviously, we were clear that we are not going to compromise and get a P1 on our production system. So that was a no-no. So the other best way to actually check was, are we getting more regression defects now than previously? Okay. Uh, quickly on the ownership transfer, what we did was, as I said, we had a distributed team. So let's say there is this project that's running on for two releases. We could run for, let's say, six sprints or six iterations. First three iterations, Bangalore took the responsibility. We had two members from London who paired with the Bangalore folks. So the dev manager from Bangalore was responsible for it, the BA from Bangalore. Um, and in the next three iterations, the project shifted over to London with two members from Bangalore. So what you have is, uh, earlier you had two members from London. Now they have context. They've got, you've got two more members from Bangalore. So these four folks would now pair with folks from London. So you've got a larger set of folks in London who would uh, work on this. So over about six sprints, uh, that fu functionality is delivered and the component also gets transferred over to London. Going forward, the London team takes care of supporting, maintaining all of those, uh, every, anything and everything that comes from the component. Uh, we know they already mentioned this. Uh, this was a project whereby we were not supposed to halt our production uh, system and improvements. So this was literally, we analyzed at that point, like changing the pilot while you are flying. In our top management, they took it as uh, building the aeroplanes while you are shifting the manufacturing plant. Uh, so, so this was pretty good uh, exercise uh, that we did. Uh, running out of time, I'll just skip through. A uh, couple of things on the risks. It was a very risky proposition, so we, uh, we initially uh, spent quite a lot of time in analyzing each of the risks that could happen, and if that happens, what the mitigation would be. And we went through in a, in a great detail. All right, so um, you know there are a lot more things uh, to be covered on this. In fact, I'm actually writing a book on this in terms of the learnings, the methodologies, how we can abstract this and really apply this across. Uh, but a quick uh, sense in terms of how we, how we think we should approach something of this nature is first understand the real scope. Yeah. So first understand the real scope. The real scope almost always is not knowledge. Uh, that is only a subset of what you're trying to. You, you, you've, got, you've got things like uh, processes. When a new team takes over, they will change how they are doing things. You've got, you've got things around engineering. You know, how we are doing continuous integration in Bangalore could be different uh, in terms of how it's being done in London. What TDD means in Bangalore could be slightly different in terms of what TDD means in London. Multiple things around that. Infrastructure, as I said, we had about 650 virtual machines. 
Does London procure more? Do you transfer from Bangalore to London? That can become a project in itself. Um, and of course, the team structure itself. We had a functional team running in Bangalore. London had more product-centric teams. When you transfer over, uh, what, does, what, what does that mean for the team structures? In so multiple things, plethora of I items that will again come in. Create a framework. As I said, we were initially grappling a lot with how do you even address it. So code is at the center. That always has to be the case. And documentation will not suffice. Um, and automation scripts are also code. We realize that you can actually transfer a lot of knowledge just by working on the automation script because you get to know the functionality that much more. Uh, plan, plan evolved. You know, we had that big plan. Uh, not all of it actually uh, eventually happened. But the most important thing is don't try to do this in one month or two months. Knowledge transfer cannot happen in one or two months. Uh, you know, you could probably ramp up one team member and that too not completely. But you can't do it in one or two months. This, you know, for us this took us 10 months and that too after we had been working together for about 5 or 6 years. Um, a new team coming in trying to take over in a month or two just doesn't happen. I think that's a practical reality we all need to appreciate. Uh, uh, the, the last one is obviously execute. There are going to be a lot of issues. Things that we don't talk about, the elephant in the room, typically are all the undercurrents that are going on, people feeling insecure, people not wanting to part with knowledge, people wondering what's going to happen to their jobs and things like that. Uh, you, you've got to face it. I mean, if this is happening, it's a reality. Um, and, and, and actually just work through that and then take it forward. Okay, where is it applicable? Uh, as we mentioned, uh, all systems um, and all situations where there are two groups. It could be within the organization, development to a maintenance team. It could be between two organizations. Uh, it could be vendor to customer, custom, uh, sorry, vendor to uh, a client, client to a vendor. Or it could be two vendors and a client in between as well. In any which case, it could. And anything that has, you know, things around process, uh, around change of engineering structure or infrastructure, this is something that we feel uh, can be applied. All right, that's all we had time for. Um, any questions? keep this separate and say that this is a different project. We had underlaid the process of uh, knowledge transfer within existing projects. So we changed the team as I had mentioned. So we had people from Bangalore and London pairing on this. Uh, so in that process, folks in London started getting more context of the course. Yeah, we had one story which accounted for the velocity, the budgeting. Um, and, and the effort that would get spent. In every iteration, we had one story to track for that. But velocity actually increased, so that was a bonus for us. What about the process of knowledge transfer? Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think, I think that's a very, very good question. Uh, the way we look at it is uh, what principles and elements of Agile that we have adopted. Uh, for example, uh, things that we did not touch around. We had those 17 knowledge transfer units that we had to. We did an MEP around it. Uh, we actually only transferred about 13 of those. Uh, we prioritized and decided these are the ones. And we didn't decide it first when we started off. So that was the first thing. The whole concept of using pairing uh, and using remote pairing uh, to actually transfer this process was something that from an agile perspective we had, uh, we had adopted. Um, and and you know, how we had utilized the distributed team through this whole process. So those were certain elements of agile that we had absolutely utilized through this process. Almost every agile practice with only two people, saw how, how it works, and adopt, adapted to it, and then increase okay. the size. Yeah. Okay. So can we take other questions often? Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. Thank you very much.